Hello, and welcome to this lecture entitled Managing American Imperialism, the U.S. as a World Power under Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson. This lecture will discuss how Presidents Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson, shown here, managed the new role the Americans took to themselves, an emerging world power and colonizer. Theodore Roosevelt's diplomacy is called Big Stick Diplomacy. It comes from what Roosevelt claimed was an African proverb, speak softly and carry a big stick, you will go far. Roosevelt was concerned with the Caribbean and Pacific, just as his immediate predecessors had been. Big stick diplomacy sounded stronger and more bellicose than it actually was. In fact, it emerged from weakness that relied on bombast rather than bombs, as well as bribery, threatened interventions, and nuanced negotiations. So let's look at some illustrative incidents of the big stick and the soft talk. The Panama Canal is probably the biggest one of these. The U.S. fomented a rebellion in the Panama provinces of Colombia after Colombia rejected U.S. payment to acquire the Panama Canal Zone. When the Panamanians won, after a U.S. warship kept Colombian troops bottled up in the harbor, Panama granted U.S. concessions to complete the canal that had been begun by Suez Canal builder Ferdinand de Lesseps in 1881, but was abandoned in 1894. The U.S. completed the canal in 1913 and opened it for traffic in August 1914. The U.S. also intervened in the Dominican Republic between 1903 and 1905 that led to the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine in 1904. The Roosevelt Corollary was this, where the Monroe Doctrine of 1823 had promised that the U.S. would stay out of European wars and demanded that European countries stay out of New World business, the Roosevelt Corollary went further, claiming the right of the U.S. to intervene in the affairs of New World states if conditions in those states might lead to European interventions. Thus a Dominican default on debts owed to European banks led to a threatened invasion, and so the U.S. invaded first. Such interventions were the big stick, but T.R. also spoke softly. He negotiated an end to the 1904-1905 Russo-Japanese War before the Japanese defeated Russia, which would have led to the downfall of the Tsar and turmoil in the Far East. Roosevelt won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1906 for these efforts. We've already spoken about the Gentlemen's Agreement of 1907 that prevented diplomatic retaliations over San Francisco's racial segregation of 90 Japanese schoolchildren. Roosevelt blended both the big stick and the soft speech in deploying the Great White Fleet. The Great White Fleet was an around-the-world tour of a new batch of American battleships, produced as a consequence of Roosevelt's intrigue with Mann's 1890 book, Influence of Sea Power Upon History, 1660-1783. Rather than have the ships painted a dull gray for war, Roosevelt wanted them to stand out and to indicate the mailed fist in a velvet glove, that is, an implied threat of force. So the Navy painted the ships white with gold trim, and when sailing at night, always had lights ablaze. The first stop was Tokyo Harbor, where there was a real concern among U.S. governmental officials that the Japanese would consider this an act of war. But the Japanese welcomed the fleet with open arms which was not a harbinger of future relations, but did prevent war at that point. Coming to the presidency in 1909, William Howard Taft pursued what he dubbed dollar diplomacy. He designed it to replace the warlike and political diplomacy of Theodore Roosevelt with peaceful and economic diplomacy. Taft used U.S. economic intervention rather than military threats to stabilize hot spots and to promote U.S. corporate interests but he was also not shy about using the military if he thought he needed to do so. Additionally, he was not particularly interested in what Europe thought of the U.S. Here are some incidents in Taft's dollar diplomacy. In 1909, he tried to arrange a loan for Honduras against foreign debt, 
in which his administration unsuccessfully negotiated a deal so that U.S. bankers would buy up $110 million of English-owned debt. Again, this was unsuccessful. In Nicaragua, American financial interests paid for a revolution in 1909. The U.S. sided with the rebellion. Then rebels sought a loan secured by customs revenues in 1911. The U.S. intervened in 1912 to suppress a rebellion against the new government and sent in Marines. Across the world in Manchuria, the northernmost province of China, Taft contradicted the unofficial agreement of 1905 that kept the U.S. from intervening against Japan in Manchuria. Taft tried to get U.S. bankers admitted to a European finance Huquang Railroad scheme in 1909, the political machinations of which inadvertently led Japan and Russia to form a closer defense alliance. Taft arranged U.S. capital to finance a currency reform in 1910, but that ended in fomenting rebellion in northern China. Now let's look at Woodrow Wilson. Wilson was an idealist, yet a realpolitiker, who claimed to prefer moral diplomacy, but who was no pushover. He wanted to make the world into a progressive place, and the U.S. the single world leader because of its moral force and apparent lack of self-interest. But he also sought to protect U.S. national and business interests. Let's look at Wilson's Caribbean diplomacy. He was not as focused on foreign policy as a whole as were his predecessors, and certainly not on the Pacific. Under Wilson, the U.S. intervened militarily in multiple countries. It occupied Nicaragua on and off from 1912 to 1925. The military also occupied the Dominican Republic from 1915 to 1924, and Haiti from 1915 to 1934. In addition, the military occupied Cuba from 1917 to 1922. But it's the Mexican Revolution that was Wilson's biggest foreign policy worry before World War I, for the Mexican Revolution threatened U.S. corporate interests, especially copper mining and oil. Porfirio Diaz became president in 1876, and he turned himself into a dictator, and a revolution overthrew him in 1911. The new president of the new revolutionary government was Francisco Madero. He was overthrown after a two-year term in 1913 by General Victoriano Huerta, who was a general under Porfirio Diaz but had survived the first revolution. He was president in 1913 and 1914. Huerta had some issues. After his coup against Madero, he had Madero, his brother, and his vice president summarily executed, assassinated. Because of the blatantness of this assassination, Wilson refused to recognize Huerta as the legitimate president of Mexico. In 1914, the U.S. almost went to war against Huerta. This began in Tampico and Veracruz. In Tampico, local military units arrested some U.S. sailors due to a misunderstanding, then released them in a few minutes once they understood that the sailors were just trying to get gasoline that they had purchased. The U.S. commander sought an apology from the Mexican commander and received it, then demanded that the Mexican military raise the U.S. flag on Mexican soil and fire a 21-gun salute to it, which the Mexican commander refused to do. Tensions built until Wilson asked for and received congressional approval to invade Tampico and Veracruz. Veracruz was occupied to prevent German arms from being transported to Huerta from German merchant ships. An armed conflict actually occurred in Veracruz in which 19 Americans were killed and 150 Mexicans were killed. A standoff developed in Tampico and Veracruz for about two months, and in the summer, President Huerta's government fell to rebel forces under Emiliano Zapata. The U.S. continued to occupy Veracruz for a full seven months. After Huerta fell, 
Venustiano Carranza became president, 1915 to 1920. He was recognized by the Wilson government, but one of his generals rose in rebellion. This general was Pancho Villa. In 1915, he attacked U.S. citizens and U.S. soil as revenge against U.S. recognition of Carranza's government and faulty bullets that he had purchased, and to get the U.S. to intervene in Mexican affairs in hope that a second invasion would topple Carranza. The Americans sent an expeditionary force under General John Blackjack Pershing to pursue Villa in Chihuahua in 1916 through February of 1917. This is called the Punitive Expedition. It accomplished little except to billet troops and improve the economies of dirt poor towns along the U.S. border. The Punitive Expedition returned home. They were National Guard units for the most part, just in time to be mustered into federal service for U.S. entry into World War I. And you can see in this image, Pancho Villa in the center, and on our left, Blackjack Pershing, at a calmer, more peaceful time between them. In summary, the administrations of Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, and Woodrow Wilson had to manage the United States' new role as an emerging world power. Roosevelt called his approach Big Stick Diplomacy. Where he could use the threat of force to achieve his aims, he did so. Where he could use negotiations, he did so. He intervened to secure land for the Panama Canal and to prevent European nations from invading New World nations that defaulted on loans. He promulgated his Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine of 1823, saying that European countries must stay out of the Western Hemisphere and that the U.S. had the right to intervene in the internal affairs of New World nations to prevent European interventions. Taft's diplomacy is called dollar diplomacy because he tried, sometimes successfully, other times not, to get American financiers involved in foreign schemes that promoted U.S. interests. Taft was interested in expanding American economic interests in both the Pacific and the Caribbean. He had the U.S. military invade weak countries like Nicaragua to protect corporations. Wilson pursued what he thought of as moral diplomacy to spread democracy and national independence, but where moral suasion failed, he deployed troops. He occupied Nicaragua, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, and Cuba, and almost went to war with Mexico. Wilson's administration would be dragged into the first European conflict the United States ever entered. Two of the most fervent voices for intervention in Europe, contrary to the Monroe Doctrine, were former presidents Theodore Roosevelt and William Howard Taft. This ends this lecture, and as always, thank you for your attention.